Welcome to Expresso Engineering. I am Steve Ferguson. Join me as I guide you through the test methods of Mill Standard 461F. As we continue our journey through Mill Standard 461F test methods, today's topic will be CE 102. This is conducted emissions in the 10 kilohertz to 10 megahertz frequency range and it measures voltage appearing on the power lines of the test article. This is used to determine if there is interference that could be coupled from any particular test article back to the distribution system for power and coupled onto other equipment sharing this common power bus. The uh, lines are applicable to all the test leads or, or equipment that obtains power from other than the test article itself for example, other power sources, the bus, et cetera. It's applicable to all the services and agencies, so it's widely used as a test method. And the limits are provided based on the voltage that's the, the nominal voltage that's appearing at the terminals. For example, the basic curve represents 28 volts. A, a relaxation of 6 dB would be applicable to a 110 volt system. The test equipment necessary is pretty standard, a receiving system. With, they use it in the peak detection mode and uh, the right bandwidths that are selectable. Note that the bandwidth refers to the intermediate frequency or resolution bandwidth of the uh, analyzer receiving system. Quite frequently there are video filters that appear and these must be set not to limit the emissions. So video filtering must be much, much higher than the resolution bandwidth. Normally you set it to the maximum of available uh, level. Uh, you need some sort of transient limiter. Quite frequently an attenuator is put in line to take care of power line transients that may appear as you connect or start the test article to prevent damage from your spectrum analyzer or your receiving system. Uh, there's a correction factor that applies to those, so it must be considered. Line impedance stabilization networks or lesions are put into place and these are used as a measurement port. And obviously there's cables associated with the measurement system, so a correction factor applies. Now we need to verify the calibration of the measurement system. That's one of our first steps once we select the hardware that will be used. Basically we need to configure it as we would, and I can go to the board and discuss this, and how this process is done for a verification. Our measurement system our receiver. In our case, it's going to be a spectrum analyzer. Connects to the LISN. And obviously there's a secondary LISN for the other power line, so each lead is in fact put into play. So we have these LISNs that connect to provide power for our test article. Our EUT is a normal situation. The LISN connects to a measurement port of the LISN. The receiver connects. So our goal is to check that the LISN measurement port, cable, and receiver, and everything associated with the measurement side is in fact verified to be our calibration. The system verifies that if the correction factors that are applicable to each of the pieces are in fact added or subtracted as necessary, we get the right answer. So to do this, we are going to take away our EUT and we're going to inject a signal into the power line. We're going to inject a known signal coming into the power line through a signal generator. Inject a signal of a known voltage into the lesson. Note, make sure that power is not applied. Because if you have primary power plugged in to your signal generator, you will not last very long. It's called rapid disassembly. The, uh, so this is opened up, and we inject a signal, and we measure the signal we're injecting to make sure the receiver measures that properly. Here's a sad situation. Those signal generators we use have a 50 ohm output. And the listen is designated to be 50 ohms. So therefore, that's an impedance match through the system. In reality, at lower frequencies, the LISN is not 50 ohms. It can approach 5 ohms. 
So when that occurs, a low impedance lizen connected to a higher impedance than, it, than the lizen would cause the signal generator output level not to be what it says it is on the output meter. So we need to verify that in fact this thing is properly connected. So let us put something in here, a T, into the circuit to measure what we're applying. We can put an oscilloscope into the equation and measure what's going on here. Note that there's cable links that are involved here that you have to consider. The standard spells out what they are. We in fact measure the signal that we're producing and verify that it is the level that we targeted. What's our target level? We set a limit line and we need to measure 6 dB below that limit line. So whatever the limit is, and let's assume for instance it may be 98, 98 minus 6 would be 92, so our dB microvolts would be 92. We set the signal generator to minus two, 92, excuse me, to 92 dB microvolts and see if we measure that. Now we know at low frequencies this is not 50 ohms, so we verify that the 92 is in fact measured here. Whatever we need to adjust the generator to to produce the 92 is our goal. So we're adjusting for, or we're compensating for these losses. The receiver then is used to measure by running the software. Again, if we have a limit line that comes into play, we take a particular signal and we measure it, the difference should be 6 dB. Plus or minus 3 is our tolerance for uncertainty through the system. So we see that the difference, because we targeted, we set a generator level at 6 dB below, we in fact run the software executing against the measurements for the receiver and see that it produces the right level. That's the whole calibration process in a nutshell. <laughs> in a few moments we'll be in the laboratory and look at what this means to us as we execute the program. But let's discuss going on into the measurement side of this uh, element before we continue. We almost have everything set up for measurement. Our signal generator now goes away in our oscilloscope. We're not trying to do that. And by the way, that oscilloscope we talked about gets taken out of the picture at higher frequencies. Once the LISN gets to where it is 50 ohms at frequencies, then the signal generator that we were using, let me put it back in play here, the signal generator is in fact matched, so what the meter says on its output is in fact really what we're producing. So the oscilloscope and the T circuit to connect it goes away. We don't really want to keep it in picture because it affects higher frequencies. So we produce a signal and measure these various places. They would be on out here where we're producing various signals. So our calibration is several points in our whole measurement frequency band. Now we get ready to go into the testing. We take our signal generator away and we connect our test article. Our test article comes into play. Our EUT. We now want to measure the emissions coming back here at the same measurement port. Remember we have another listen over here and we put a terminator on that item to keep everything in fact matched. 50 ohm termination here by our receiver and a 50 ohm here through a terminator. We then measure the emissions running the software and collect our data. Whatever those values are, we will get a, an emissions profile that comes out and obviously it's over the limit. There's a, it represents a failure and we need to consider what's going on here. Ambient measurements might need to be taken. An ambient measurement would be considered when I have a failure and says, well, is that something to do with my EUT and its support equipment that may be associated with it? So our EUT gets shut off, a terminator gets put in its place to represent the same current as the EUT, and an ambient test is done. Assuming our same limit line, if the ambient measurements all comply, then the test article is represented as being the cause of the emission. If it doesn't comply, we have issues there, we need to look at that area and figure out the problem. What's associated with our setup that causes this issue? But assuming that we pass, if we had passed to begin with, everything's happy, we don't need to do the ambient test. We do this to verify that everything is good only if there's a problem with the test results. 
we're verifying all of our system noises are in fact below the limit, at least 6 dB. So if this complies, the ambient testing is not required. If it doesn't, we simply examine the uh, outputs and evaluate the product compared to the limit. This is a test. We're not trying to solve the problem right now. It's simply a test. With that, we're ready to go to the lab and demonstrate these things that we've discussed and see if we can actually produce a passing compliant product. Well, welcome to the laboratory. As we discussed in the cafe earlier, we're going to do a CE-102 calibration verification. And we talked about a signal generator producing the signal on the output. And we cable that system to our line impedance stabilization network. We bring it over to the connection where we inject into the power port, connect our return to the body of the LISM, and our output measurement port of the LISM comes to our limiter. The limiter is the protection device for our, our receiver system and into the cable that connects to the receiving system, the measurement. These are the points that go through calibration and we're verifying that they're correct. Our input measurement, remember we have this uh, LISN that has the low input impedance at 10 kilohertz and 100 kilohertz, so we must measure what we're actually applying. So we have the T connection to this. Notice that our cable length is kept under the two meters as prescribed by the standard. We are verifying this lesson, and we'll do the same thing for each lesson we use in the measurement system. For example, if four lesions are in a three-phase system with neutral, we would do this calibration on each lesson to make sure everything is correct and everything is working normally. With that, let us start the calibration process by doing the math. We've selected an AC power limit. The AC power limit at 10 kilohertz is 100 dB microvolts, so our target value is to go to uh, 94. The LISN factor is approximately 4.5, and the limiter factor that we discussed is 10. We put no attenuators or cables, and we just simply use this to record. We don't do the math. So <clears throat> what this says is to get 94 dB microvolts, I need to make 15 millivolts appear on the oscilloscope, 50.1 millivolts on the oscilloscope on the output. So I will turn the RF on. I've got this set to measure millivolts. And I'll adjust the output up until I get to 50.1 millivolts at 10 kilohertz. And we'll get there. Fifty point one millivolts is my target. And overran slightly. Fifty point one is right there. So now I have the signal going in and we're verifying it's there. So all I should have to do if everything is working correctly is execute the software. With this I've set the software data collection up for CE102 to look at the 10 to 12 kilohertz region. I do want the chart to work correctly. So let me set the extremes for the chart. And the values should be no less than 40 and no more than uh, 110, 100, 110. So we have the chart set up. We should be able to go. With that, I want to put in the listen that I'm actually using. So let me verify the number. And the number is 128. Number 128 will be selected as our measurement piece. Our cable factor is number 485 that we've chosen. I have the, uh, uh, the attenuator. I have to account for that 10 dB limiter. So let me place that selection in. So that will work for my limiter. And I have something selected and I can continue the process to run this test. I'm going to select a file name, Cal102, and execute the software to do the operation. If I have everything set correctly, we should be able to verify that we are getting the right answer. So my value is 
100 for my limit and the value I'm measuring is about 95.1. My goal was to be at 94 plus or minus 3 dB, so I'm well within the tolerance bands for what this should be. This process continues for the next frequency of interest, which happens to be 100 kilohertz would be the next one. So I'll take this file away. I go back to my worksheet so I can know the value I'm going for. At this point, the limit is 80, so my target value is 74, 60 dB below the limit, with the limiter to be the same, and I have a cable, but I'm not using it. So I'm going to adjust at 100 kilohertz a 5 millivolt signal on the oscilloscope. So we adjust the oscilloscope to see 5 millivolts, frequency 100 kilohertz. And I adjust the level down, the amplitude, to get to 5 millivolts RMS. And I can make this oscilloscope adjust where we can see that we're getting to the right value. I'm looking for 5 millivolts RMS. And that represents fairly close. There's 5.02. So we should be ready to capture the next piece of data. We've set the next frequency. Execute the software, except now I'm going for the 100 kilohertz, so let me do 90 kilohertz to 110 kilohertz, just so I encompass the whole band. Run the test. I've still got the same hardware that I had before, so I'll leave that selected. And I pin the file by do choosing an overwrite to replace, and I say I will do accept that. And we run the software again. The software now collects this measurement point. It demonstrates that we are measuring right at 6 dB below the limit as we expected. These are our measurement points, so we're gradually building the chart of calibrations. Our next step would be to do uh, 2 megahertz, I believe, is the next value for Cal. And I can verify that by looking at our worksheet, 2 megahertz. My goal is 60 dB microvolts. And if now we're at the point where the LISN is now 50 ohms or a competitive match between our signal generator impedance and the uh, uh, LISN impedance. So at this point, our oscilloscope gets out of the equation. So we take it away and disconnect that cable and place our direct output. We now set the frequency of the signal generator to 2 megahertz and our amplitude to 60 dB microvolts, 60 dB microvolts. And we should have a value that's competitive, uh, it's appropriate for the, the LISM. So we go in and collect our data, do this, and I'm going to select a 2 megahertz, so let me run from 1.5 megahertz to 2.5 megahertz and see if we get this right answer. We go. We still have the same hardware in our measurement path. Even though the oscilloscope came out, we, that we're not affecting our measurement path. So we're looking at our LISN, our limiter, and our cable. We overwrite the file one more time and save. Replace it. Yes, I do want to do that. And we execute the software and see if this measurement comes out to be correct. In fact, we have this measurement. It's sitting right on the line at 60, which is 60 dB below. It's exactly right on the, the target. We do one more run at uh, 10 megahertz, and the level should be 60 also, but I'll verify that. The level is 60. So we simply set the frequency of... Again, I don't want to exactly go on 10 because it's the edge of the graph, so 9.95 megahertz. I've still got 60 set up for the signal generator output. So all I should have to do is execute the software, get rid of the picture from the last run, and I go from 9 megahertz to 10 megahertz, and that should run. Same hardware is included with the system. Select our file to append the file, yes. And we should be executing that software and get the right answer if everything is working correctly. And we, in fact, measure about 61 and a half, and our target was 60, so we're 1.5 dB high, well within our plus and minus 3 dB. 
That completes our calibration verification. Our system is working right. We would need to do this for each lizard in the picture to make sure it's all right. If there is a problem, then we should go ahead and resolve that issue, find out what's wrong with it, correct, and then run the data again after the corrections are made. With that, CE-102 is complete. Well, welcome to the laboratory. We discussed CE-102 up in the uh, cafe a little while ago. We're ready to run the testing. The calibration verification was done, as you just saw us complete, and we're getting ready to do the test. I have the test article configured, and I have my limiter that we'll use as the interface to protect our instrumentation. You saw this during the calibration verification. We'll put it back in play. The test article is set up. We've got the connections all placed like they should be for the mill standard. Our cables are dressed out with the links appropriate. Notice that the cable itself is much shorter than prescribed, but it's the actual test in, in place. So it doesn't have to be as long as described because it's actual. We now come over and remember for our safety, we're now working with live terminals. 110 volts is supplied to verify the unit's working. And we're going to come up to our measurement port on our LISM take away our terminator, and we leave the terminator on the opposite side. The fact that we connect this term, this measurement system terminates this in a balanced mode between the two pieces. We could get this connected, verify everything's tight, and so our cable arrangements are now set up so we can measure the phase lead of the system. We're now connected back over, so all we need to do to finish the test is just simply execute the software to run the test. I've set the parameters up on our software for data collection to go from 10 kilohertz to 10 megahertz and we select to proceed with the test and I need to select that listen number 128 is still the one for that. Our cable is the same. We also have to deal with our attenuator, our transit limiter so let me select a software for that. I mean the, hard, uh, the hardware pieces so it knows how to look up the factors. And there's the right item. And we continue with our execution of software. I'm going to choose CE102 phase lead. CE102 phase lead and run the program. And the program should just simply collect all the data necessary and compare it to the limit. And we notice that we have a failure of the test article. <clears throat> it doesn't comply. We have a few little frequencies of concern, particularly at about at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, at 70 kilohertz, we have an overlimit condition, and again at 80 kilohertz, we have an overlimit condition. That should represent a test article problem. We're not sure. I didn't have my chart set very well, so we're way under the limit here and not visible because I didn't know the extremes. I didn't know to set the chart, so now that I have the data, I will set the lower boundary more properly, and we will rerun this particular test so I can be visible to the data. And I'm going to CE102 phase. And save the data. So we rerun the test to be sure that we're consistent with everything. And we can see the rest of the chart is fine. So we have three overlimit conditions at 70 kilohertz, uh, approximately 80 kilohertz, and in between. So between, so between 65 and 80 kilohertz, and then again at about 240 kilohertz, we have some overlimit conditions resulting from this AUT. Uh, we would do this same test on the other lead, but. Since we did fail, we're obligated now to run an ambient test to see if it's truly the test article causing the problem. In our case, we would need to replace the test article with a resistive load to prove that it, in fact, is the test article. Here's the sad situation. 
the test article is the sole entity. There's nothing else here that could produce the emissions besides the test article. No support equipment except our computer and analyzer. So turning the test article off would represent an evaluation in this case. Uh, typically, once we see that and there's no other support equipment attached to the unit, we wouldn't bother. So to be consistent, I will, in fact, turn the unit off and run the test again just to be sure. And I'm going to phase, and I'm going to name this one the ambient condition. All of the same hardware is in fact good. And I'm going to choose the file name of ambient and run the test again. And we should be able to produce this data very shortly. And it's very quiet. So the test article is obviously the source of these emissions. Now you notice that I didn't bother to set the <coughs> current thing into a resistive load as I should have because that would <coughs> represent a true load condition for power sources. We know that this is a situation of it being the only entity on the power line, so we know it's quiet. So in fact, we're very sure that the only problem is the test article itself. Now, <coughs> so that represents the test. I would move the connections to the uh, neutral line, and that would complete the test. Thanks for joining me on this MIL standard 461F test method review. I hope you find it helpful. I also hope you find the time to join us through the complete journey from L standard 461F via the Expresso Engineering Series. Thanks for watching.